Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, a human heated planet, still a pandemic wrapped planet. Sadly, there's still several billion people with a B who have not received one shot. I'm one of those privileged people because I'm a senior citizen who has now had four, two boosters and two shots. And um, there's still so much work to be done on all these fronts. And now along comes war, uh, violence uh, perpetrated by Vladimir Putin uh, invading a peaceful neighbor. And that the ramifications of that turbulent event are still unfolding. So it's a time for all kinds of emotions and all kinds of actions. Today's session of Sustain What, we're going to focus on reflecting it's on what generations can do together, the young and the old, and also on how to get started, how to find traction amid such complexity, consequence, and um, seeming momentousness. You know, system change is what we all understand is necessary for all the things we care about. But how do you get there is really hard. I, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm Andy Revkin at the Columbia Climate School. Uh, and this is a uh, probably the close to the 300th episode of Sustain What, which started in the early days of the pandemic. I'm going to start with a song here from Dar Williams, my friend and neighbor, who last fall released an album and also had a campaign going around the hashtag uh, uh, today and every day. And it's about, it's basically a defense of incrementalism and individual action. And we'll talk about that too. So it's, it's a quickie and it's kind of fun. So here we go. Hey there, polar bear is quite a mess we found Life is one heavy trip, our paws are sinking in the ground I see you out lumbering at the break of dawn How can we survive and save the day before the day is gone? Well, I know I'm gonna find a way I know I'm gonna like the way if I'm ever gonna make it, then I gotta say, I can't save the world today and every day. Young blood coming up and coming from behind. You know you've got the force to change the world and it's your mind. Your big plans are shining like the bright rays of the sun. We can't be done when all I see is that you just begun. I know you're gonna find a way. I know you're gonna light the way. So if we're ever gonna make it, then you gotta say, I can't save the world today and every day. So say the smallest things don't count, then say the big things don't amount to any answers either. Man, there is no break of breather. There's no time for this mock frustration. I say everyone, everyone's a power station. Mm -hmm. Save the world a little every day. Hey there, polar bear, I know this much is true. There are so many, many, many things that we can do. If we don't go and lay it on the line, what will we tell tomorrow when tomorrow says we have this time? Well, I know we're gonna find a way. I know we're gonna light the way, and I know we're gonna make it, but we gotta say, we can't save the world today, every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today and every day, every day. So today and every day, uh, the line I like in there is everyone's a power station. And we have, I've got some powerhouses here uh, from several generations today. I hope you're going to share this with folks out there. Um, 
by now or later. Uh, let me just stop that from playing. Today with us is uh, Dennis Hayes, who uh, at the tender age of 25 uh, in 1970 uh, was the first, was the national student coordinator trying to build the this thing that became Earth Day. And it's great to have you here with those who are doing similar work today. Um, Jocelyn Chen is the editor in chief of Consilience Journal, the Journal of Sustainable Development. That's a, a university project at Columbia and uh, fantastic. Uh, she, she's coming from the biomedical, biological sciences. You'll learn more about Jocelyn in a minute. Uh, Sophia Asab, who's graduating shortly uh, in the Sustainable Developer, Development Program. And Reggie Harris, uh, Troubadour, a truth teller, a poet, um, a community builder, focused on justice and the environment. Uh, I think you're you're at home, but you're heading on the road shortly. I'm sure. Totally. It must feel great to be on the road again as a musician. It's wonderful. Um, it's wonderful. It's weird. It's um, but yeah, to be in the presence of people actually enjoying and singing uh, is amazing. Yeah, that Dar Dar and and you are very special because you don't just come and play and go on to the next gig. She wrote a whole book called A Thousand uh, What I Learned in a Thousand Towns. Hmm. You know, and you've been brought to hundreds, if not a thousand. Oh, towns. thousands. <laughs> yeah. I've been at this for a long time. <laughs> no, I'm not as youthful as I look. <laughs> no. Um, so, so that you know, community is a big part of what uh, travelers like you uh, convene and meet with and and interact with. We'll learn more about those the lessons you've learned on the road uh, shortly. Uh, just I want to just check in with each one of you and just see how you're doing. Uh, Jocelyn, you remind me of your your degree. You're going into is it biomedical science or? Um. So I'm doing an undergrad in biomedical engineering. And what do you, what's your like passion? What's driven you into that? Um, so I think in high school, I went to school in rural Connecticut. So I think being around nature, we had a Darwin club at my high school where we would go into the woods. We have our, um, a cabin that our, that was like student built over the years. And we do a lot of land maintenance, a lot of trail maintenance for the state of Connecticut. So I think just being in that environment it really made me appreciate how beautiful nature is. And then so when I came into college, I wanted to continue in sustainable development. And then my other half is um, more science. So there's like stencil engineering, which I'm always fascinated by. Um, so I'm just kind of pursuing both in different areas of Columbia. And here I am. Well, and uh, you, but you also have a passion for communication. You're the editor in chief of Consilience. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what drove you to communicate what you're doing? Yeah, so I honestly joined Consilience without much um, plans for becoming editor-in-chief. I knew that I was interested in science. I was fascinated by the world of publications and how just simply the process of taking an idea, writing about it, and then publishing it in a formal way. Like, what is that? What does publishing mean? How is that different from putting it on a blog or going through a journal? So. Um, after joining, I was, I then learned about the whole process of building a journal, of creating a coherent conversations through, like, conversation through our various publication. Um, so what Professor Epkin is showing right now is our issue from spring 2021. And um, somehow with, from like 40, 50 submissions, we put together a publication that's I think the common thing is probably energy. We have the first article that is um, that is like a novel technology from University of Pennsylvania to like use bacteria to produce um, like energy, and then we have a policy discussion. I believe um, there's some yeah. finance in there. So somehow this conversation of energy just came up as we were selecting the manuscripts. And this just fascinated me about how it, like we receive submissions from all around the world, but somehow it all, every year, it's just different themes, different interests people want to write about and putting it together. Um, so it's fantastic. kind of an interesting process, yeah. Well, you learned a, a huge amount and that idea of having a worldwide community is so indicative of what's possible now. 
on this planet. You know, we, when, when Dennis and I were your age, I hate saying that when I was your age, um, you know, there were libraries and there were phone directories and there were newspapers, but there wasn't this ability to just sort of bring everyone together the way you're doing. So that's fantastic. And, um, Sophia, you, you have a passion for driving progress in t troubling times. You, you created what you call Generation Mad with a couple of friends. Could you just explain what you're up to there? Yeah, I, um, I definitely have a passion for progress in troubling times. And Generation Mad uh, is kind of what we're doing here today, just a space where people can come together and use communication to drive change. Um, I just had some really interesting discussions when I came to Columbia about like how storytelling and change and how the humanities and sciences need to kind of come together to to create the change necessary to tackle the climate crisis. So Generation Mad is just a space, as Andy knows, where we, as the three, myself and my other two co-hosts, um, are all in college at the moment and seeing things from a certain lens of, okay, we're just starting building, starting to build our toolkit. Um, how do we how do we learn from the people who have been doing this for many, many years and how do we collaborate? And it's really interesting. I'm actually in a Columbia class right now um, called Your Longer Life. And it's all about creating intergenerational solutions. And our final project was actually creating an inter intergenerational solution to climate change. Um, and I just kept thinking about Generation Mad the whole time. And for everyone who doesn't know the acronym, it stands for either making a difference or mutually assured destruction. So we're kind of asking our listeners and viewers to make a choice, which which you want to see in the future. That's so great. I, I love that dual nature, the dual nature of that acronym. It just shows you that we're poised uh, every day at a juncture toward um, making things a little better or sitting on our hands or actually making things worse, which unfortunately some people seem still, still dead set on trying to do. So Dennis, you've been patient and back to you now in the context of your 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 journey. Um, can we time shift to when you were 25 briefly and take us a little bit on that? Well, I would love what to. That was like. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was lithe and limber and able to exercise. Um, well, the, the, the times then were just so different from today that it's it's hard to believe that it's all part of a continuing story of a, uh, we, we had a society that was dominated by the war in Vietnam. Uh, we have wars pretty much all the time, it seems, but the war in Vietnam, we still had conscription in the draft and that lent a level of emotionality to it that has been mostly lacking since. Um, and then the civil rights movement was in, in full voice uh, uh, by 1970, uh, Martin Luther King, unfortunately, had been assassinated. And, uh, the, the whole movement was uh, coming out of a set of victories, the, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and, and yet in a deeply disturbed and troubled time, uh, filled with passions and, and a, a number of major, no other name for it, riots that, that destroyed huge parts of cities. And amidst all of this tumult, uh, the environment was, was not first and foremost on most people's minds, uh, but there were a lot of passionate concerns for individual issues, uh, which is to say there were people who were fighting hard to stop a freeway from coming through and destroying their vibrant neighborhoods. There were people who were concerned about air pollution from a local power plant or from automobiles that were uh, diminishing their kids' life expectancies. Uh, people who'd uh, been when they were young, able to swim and fish in nearby streams and lakes, now found themselves prohibited from going in because they've been so heavily poisoned. Uh, Rachel Carson, uh, endangered species, save the whales. All of this stuff was there as issues that certain parts of society cared passionately about. And what we did with Earth Day in 1970 was to weave all of those different fibers into a coherent fabric called the environment, where if you cared passionately about one of those things, 
uh, you would be involved with all of the others who shared that same basic set of values. It turned it into a movement that was capable of accomplishing things. That was a remarkable, uh, was it sort of understood at the time that that's what was you were doing or is it more reflecting back and realizing that that's when it became that some coherence emerged? Um, it, it was realized to some extent. What, I mean, we, we consciously set out to give um, people in communities a framework in which to hang the local issues that they cared about. It was the local power plant, the local lake, the what have you. And yet we had in the, in the selection of the name uh, aspirations to deal with something that was much broader and to tie it into this, as I said, broader fabric. Uh, it, we called it Earth Day because that resonated with everybody far more than the other names that we'd consider, certainly environmental teaching or uh, Green Day or uh, E-Day or Ecology Day. Earth Day just seemed to work. But it wasn't a day about the Earth so much as it was uh, the environment in the United States and the environment in the community. It wasn't until 1990 that we took Earth Day out to 141 other countries and tried to make it a, a global event. With some spectacular success, I should say, we, we now have probably every country in the world, except those that are in really war-torn regions, observing Earth Day every year. And upwards of a billion people participate. And, and before we go forward, uh, how much of it, I remember the New York Times headline, the, the story written by Joe, Joe Lallyveld, who, ended, who was my editor when I joined the paper. He wrote the daily article about the Earth Day March in New York. And it was very, it's, he described it as celebratory. The headline, everything had a, a very celebratory feel. Um, obviously there was a huge amount of tension and anger and other emotions at that time, uh, especially because of the war and the assassinations and racial unrest. But what, what was your sense of the overall spirit? Was it all of those things or, or how would you have characterized it? Yeah, in, in the organizing stuff, those of us who were uh, younger were trying to get the passion, the energy, the anger uh, into the forefront. And we did our best to steer reporters uh, in that direction. But at the same time, we made it open and, and welcoming to primary school teachers who take their kids out to pick up litter on a beach or to plant some trees, for women's organizations to be involved, uh, even Republican women's organizations. Uh, it, 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 was a, it was a bit of all of those things. But one, once again, weirdly, but we, we had a sense that, um, that if you could somehow pull this into a framework where people assigned it a high priority, we would be able to make it an electoral issue at a time when uh, we really needed some electoral issues to shift the balance. And if we could make it an electoral issue, then we could for at least a period have a, a spectacular set of legislative successes. If, if people were winning and losing elections on environmental grounds, then suddenly Congress became more responsive. And you only do that if you reach the broadest possible number of people. So it was something for all. Um, you know, George Wiley with the National Welfare Rights Organization, one of the, the strongest environmentalists, though unfortunately he died young. Um, but uh, he, he was um, a fierce in his Earth Day comments. Those were anti-war activists who were talking about the use of Agent Orange in Vietnam and anti-freeway fighters who were, you know, it's, it's hard to believe today, the enormous passions that were set up when, when somebody wanted to drive a freeway right through the middle of your neighborhood. And mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was some anger that, that Joe missed in his column. But certainly in New York, this picture that you've got in front of you right now on the screen, where Mayor Lindsay blocked off uh, 50, 60 blocks of Fifth Avenue, mm -hmm. and an estimated crowd of, of a million people gathered there. Uh, certainly that wasn't a million really angry people. That was, that was everybody. So interesting. So Reggie, uh, and we're going to circle back to our young guests and they can start asking some questions too and we can all have a conversation. Uh, we heard there about freeways coming through neighborhoods. A lot of that was very racist. Uh, and then the race issue, of course, was a huge deal at that time. And now here we have it again. You, you've been on many of my broadcasts talking about paths to reconciliation and, and justice. Uh, what was your early sense of um, that mix 
It's amazing. You know, I, you look at where we are now and I look back at those times. I remember hearing about the first Earth Day, which was uh, a gathering when I was in Philadelphia and uh, Fairmount Park uh, is where, you know, the largest number of people gathered uh, there on the plateau. And I'm just thinking about silos, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, where people's emotional and, and physical energy goes. And in those days, of course, you know, uh, I was just coming off a, a riot in my high school uh, around racial issues. And that's kind of where our energy was. And, and I just think the environment didn't really become an issue for me until I discovered Clearwater probably 10 years later. <laughs> Um, and I, I just find that, you know, so much of what I do in the world now in traveling, as we were talking earlier about traveling to different communities, is to use music to introduce ideas that are not reaching kind of a fever pitch in each of those communities to uh, to to in some way work with people to kind of lessen their anxiety and their emotional overload on the things they are working with to see that there are other things that are connected. Certainly in those days, I-95 and, and the Blue Route and all those issues, highways in Philadelphia were a major issue going and and you look at all of the places, Newark, New Jersey, where you know the, the ironbound and all those, you know. Uh, so the issues are all there, but people are are so focused on the the things they can see. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons. And of course, you know, people like uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan and Pete Seeger and, and, you know, those of us who have been in contact with all of these musical and, and you know, graphic artists who have been able to use art to widen the perspective. Um, so I think that's, you know, we're still at that really. And, and now people are emotionally overwhelmed in different ways. Yeah, for sure. Do you, does a song come to mind? I see, of course, you always have your guitar. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, it's it's on my hip all the time. But yeah, you know, I just think uh, the intersectionality of all these issues and, you know, our friend Pete Seeger was just uh, one of the, the brilliant people who saw that music could make a difference. You know, this isn't a new thing in human history, but certainly in terms of the environment, but also connecting it to the civil rights movement, connecting it to, you know, environment of financial issues. Uh, one blue sky above us, one ocean lapping all our shore, one earth so green and round, who could ask for more? A love song that actually kind of goes, you know, <laughs> Pete was really good at that. Uh, And getting people singing, you know, so that their their bodies resonated with the message. So that leaving a concert, you weren't just, oh, I heard this, I sang this, I felt this. One blue sky above us, one ocean lapping all our shore, one earth so green and round. Who could ask for more? And because I love you, I'll give it one more try to show my rainbow race. It's too soon to die. Some folks want to be like an ostrich, just bury their heads down in the sand. Some folks hope that plastic dreams can unclench all those greedy hands. Some folks want to take the easy ways. Poisons and bombs, they think we need them. Don't you know you can't kill all the unbelievers? There's no shortcut to freedom. One blue sky above us, one ocean lapping all our shore, one earth so green and round. Tell me who could ask for more? And because I love you, I'll give it one more try. 
to show my rainbow rays. It's too soon to die. Go tell all the little children, tell mothers and fathers too. This is our last chance to learn and share what's been given to me and you. One blue sky above us, one ocean lapping all our shores, one earth so green and round. Who could ask for more? And it's because I love you that I'm gonna give it one more try to show them my rainbow rays. It's too soon to die. One blue sky above us, one ocean lapping on our shore. One earth so green and round, who could ask for more? That's just great. You know, every time I hear that song, there's more depth to it than I appreciated at first. It is, maybe it's I in know. <laughs> well, you know, I you know, I returned to singing it, you know, for a while. Well, Pete has so many songs, but that one just keeps speaking to me. And it is. There's there's a lot in there. Really? So over to to uh, Sophia and Jocelyn, what uh what what's on your mind in terms of what we need to learn from you and or if you have questions for these other folks here? What are we missing and or what are you missing? I think I think just in that song, like how could we ask for more? I feel like we're I am I look around and all I see is people kind of like asking for more and more from the earth. Like let's just this is ours to take. And it's still like that. And I think there's this kind of misunderstanding that people who are younger are totally on board but in but there's just we're in this world where for example like i was reading the article about dennis and his founding of earth day and just seeing how powerful the protest movements were and also just all the protest movements of the mid 20th century i feel like i almost don't have that sense anymore as someone growing up in the 21st century where i've been told Oh, you want to change it? Get some money, and you can throw it, throw some money there, and that's how that's how we're going to create change. And I think we've really lost a sense of community and dialogue, and kind of turning back our conversation to the earth and asking the earth, like, what can we do for you now? We've got we've gotten so much from you. We've and and it hasn't really been worth it. I mean, I me as someone who gets all the benefits, I would say, no, it's not. Um, and I guess that's just like my thoughts right now after hearing Reggie sing that amazing song. And I, my question would be like, how do we, how do we regain the power in protest and in community? I mean, I think we do see that. I think we saw it in the Black Lives Matter movement um, that's continuing on, but there's still this kind of sense of like, individualism and capitalism that's like totally in kind of blocking the power that the, I, I wasn't there, but it, I kind of get the sense was more powerful before in the sixties. That's so interesting. And as we were saying earlier, you know, we're at a time when there's never been a easier way to connect with everybody, but we all sometimes feel it's very fragmented and um, at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, I would just say that it's it's easier to connect, but it's also easy to poison the waters. That's for sure. We've seen that. Um, and I'm really glad, you know, you've been on, on one of the other shows we did. You were explaining how through personal direct face-to-face -face interaction with someone who was very different than you at a protest in a 
There was a MAGA protest and a Black Lives Matter protest. Yeah, <laughs> sharing space. <laughs> and I don't think it was possible to have that experience digitally in a way that would have worked out some of the conversations you were able to have face to face. Now, there's a whole different thing when you're looking in somebody's face. And, you know, the thing that really struck me in that moment when, you know, we're sort of going at it and we're escalating and, you know, he said something and I made a face and he reacted to that. You know, he said, look at you, look at that, look at you. And I thought to myself, yeah, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, you know, he called me into account, you know, and um, mm -hmm. I had to, I had to reckon with that moment. Right. And you were describing how you had to reckon with your own rising emotions too. Yeah. 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 Really yeah that was, you know, it's easy to say all these things and, you know, you sing the songs, but, you know, are, are we actually living through that in, in those hard moments? And by the way, I'm pleased to see that Brighton Kaoma is here, uh, my, my friend and uh, a former uh, co-worker in my initiative at Columbia, a graduate of the uh, Sustainable Development of the uh, SEPA program now working at the UN for the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, Brighton, how are you? Hey, hey, Andy. Hi, everybody. I'm doing great and uh, very happy to join in. Um, and happy Earth Day to everybody. For sure. Can you describe uh, briefly your journey on this planet? I just was two days ago, I was with Brighton's childhood friend, musician Joseph Pupe. They're both from Zambia. And Brighton started out almost just after becoming a teenager, he became a radio reporter in, uh, in the environmentally challenged part of Zambia. And now uh, here you are. So just give a little sketch of your journey so far. Excellent. Um, uh, that's a very good question, Andy. And i um, uh, very happy to join you from uh, Columbia University, where the Africa Economic Forum is happening, uh, organized by Columbia Business School and the and the SIPA uh, Pan African Network. So lots of young people have come together to discuss um, opportunities as well as connect on issues related to the African continent and how it relates with the rest of the world. Uh, I was born and raised in Zambia in a copper mining town, as most of you know, dating back to the uh, 1800s, Zambia has predominantly been one of the leading producers of copper from Chile. So the major driver of our economy is through the extractive industry. So we mine copper, which has been used, uh, copper and cobalt, which are some of the raw materials used in our precious devices that we are using to connect in this digital world. So for me, growing up in an environment where legacy environmental liabilities were part of our daily lives, there were moments when rivers would get polluted, uh, moments where uh, sulfur dioxide would be emitted in the atmosphere and mostly children like myself would suffer from respiratory conditions which are preventable. But also I was seeing how women with babies on their backs would queue up at the local clinics seeking services. So all these environmental challenges were afflicting human health, but also affecting the abilities of small order farmers like my parents to be able to grow food because majority of the people in the community were subsistent farmers. So all these spillover negative uh, consequences inspired me when I was 14 to think about enhancing public dialogue around issues of the climate crisis and how uh, specific economic activities like mining and pollution are affecting the one thing we share in common, which is planet Earth. So radio, and like Twitter today or Facebook or TikTok was the lifeblood of the community. We didn't have access to, you know, broadband internet. Most people didn't have access to mobile smartphones. So radio, despite radio was like the, 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 this medium of communication that all of us tend to, to know what time it was, to hear what politicians are talking about. Um, so I thought of using it as a space to 
uh, engage in productive dialogue and advocate for a livable environment. So as a 14 year old, I would go on radio, I would bring in women who couldn't grow their crops because the environment and the land was degraded. I would bring in, you know, health um, workers that were, you know, treating certain preventable non-communicable diseases. I would bring in academicians from the nearest university to come and, you know, explain complex, you know, you know, environmental and climate challenges and how they related to our way of being. So that's what formed a lot of my foundation. And then as a radio broadcaster, I went on to train more young people, uh, mm -hmm. giving them skills in radio broadcasting and production as a means of elevating public dialogue and conversations on the climate crisis. Uh, then I supported the U United Nations Children's Fund to run annual climate conferences in Zambia would bring hundreds of young people from all corners of the country to train them in, in the climate crisis, in project management, and give them pathways for them to start their own projects. Um, fast forward, I came to Columbia University to do the Masters of Public Administration, and now I am working with the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is one of the leading uh, youth programs of the UNSDSN that mobilizes young people to localize the UNSDGs. So we work across mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, urban sustainability, education for sustainable development, and we organize the annual Vatican Youth Symposium where mm -hmm. we bring leaders in business and government. Last uh, December, we brought Maya Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, of course, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, Muhammad Yunus to engage in conversations around sustainable development with the young people. Uh, and we continue to support young people in over 127 countries by giving them all the tools they need for them to be leaders for sustainable development in their own right. I'll end here and pass on the baton to you, Andy. That's really, uh, you know, it's an amazing journey so far. My, my next phase here, and Jocelyn, I want to hear from you a little bit more next um, is on what we could do together that would be harder to do individually. In other words, uh, interlacing the the work, uh, the pod, the podcasting, Sophia, the journal, and uh, other aspirations of Jocelyn. Dennis is at the Bullet Foundation and uh, still part of the Earth Day Network. And, and the music and the arts that Reggie uh, so beautifully represents here. Where do we go that can take that concept of networked action further. So J Jocelyn, you know, you're also, are you senior? I can't remember. I'm a junior. Junior, okay, so you have one more year on campus. So we can do some things together. I, I, I've been, in my copious spare time, I've been trying to help you uh, as an advisor for consilience. Um, but what can we do to boost the impact of the journal or is there anything we can do together? Um, yeah, I think there are lots that we can do. Um, so, we can, I mean, there are a number of initiatives. We've been working on different, um, many different events. We've been trying to make our journal more heard. Um, we're also working on just the way that ac the world of academia works. Um, we've been trying to make our journal open on the international open access directory. That way researchers from around the world can go on the directory and learn about our journal and have access to our publications for free. Um, and that's not always the case, which was, a, which was quite surprising to me. Um, so I think right. there's a lot more um, communicating and just reaching a broader audience about who we are and what we do. Um, on a different note, I was having another thought um, as Reggie was singing and I was having a really reflective moment about what music really meant to me in my journey to discover my passion for sustainable development. And I think it's just there's such a like strong power in music. Um, it's something that transcends what language and what words can express. And it's something that reaches more people um, across language barriers, across cultural barriers. And we can, and it really touches like heartstrings um, in a sense. And I think um, what would really work, um, what really needs to happen to drive our movement towards 
fighting climate change and getting people together is foster that like that feeling of love for environment um really lighten that um, passion for protecting our mother earth fostering that connection to mother earth which is so hard to do when you're in a city when you're seeing the concrete jungle and so on but then music often brings us back to that spot like when you go on a camping trip you sing together or when you um, are in nature and you listen to the bird songs there's like this hawk nest that's right outside my dorm and i've been hearing the babies like chirp like all night every single night and it's just so beautiful to me um and that's music to my ears as well um so just in many ways i think um there are the logistical things of this is what we need to do to move forward but then there's also the more emotional and um personal aspects of being connected to the work that we're doing and that really makes it all the more powerful Beautifully expressed. Um, one thing that I found, I was I recently did a show, I guess it was just last month, with a group of people across the Pacific and Indian Oceans called uh, Small Island Big Song. It's a it's sort of a global music network. A couple of people and a guy in Australia and a woman in Taiwan had the idea to use the internet to connect musicians in Mauritius and in Fiji and in uh, Papua New Guinea and in Taiwan, all across these great bodies of water, all experiencing the world from the standpoint of islands. And they started in 2015 and they've done a bunch of wonderful films and YouTube channel uh, together. And I, I was going to show a little clip toward the end of the show. And it, it shows again this power of, and all of their music is driven by two things, cultural sustainability uh, indigenous, particularly. Uh, Taiwan has indigenous com uh, communities that people hardly are aware of. Uh, all these other islands have had problems with colonial uh, damage to history and culture and landscapes. And they, but what's cool is that they're now combining, they're writing songs together uh, from these different cultures. And the music is this just extraordinary stew. So I, I and you learn as you're, as you're watching, so it's kind of like visual data, arts, all together. It feels like a, there's lots there. And of course, Dennis, you know, Earth Day became a big deal for music too. There, there were, it led to some of the um, you know, biggest musicians of that time were involved um, in the anti-nuclear movement. Some of that in terms of nuclear energy now can be problematic, <laughs> depending on how you want to fill the energy gap on the planet. But uh, what's your sense of the, the role of the arts, Dennis? You're right. They've been important in a number of places, but I, I think probably underutilized. And I, I think of arts in a, in a pretty broad context. Um, the, the importance of movies around various themes, getting things introduced into television shows, all of these modes of communications that are not the evening newscast and the journal articles, but the stuff that really permeates culture. Um, and it, yeah, it's, 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 it's extraordinarily important. And every now and then there is a song that comes along that absolutely touches everyone's heartstrings. And uh, these days in, in the wake of uh, some of the efforts to raise money around uh, starvation and uh, other kinds of crises, uh, the songs <laughs> that get that level of attention are almost always fundraisers, but, uh, and, and God knows uh, these things need money, but I, I'm sort of saddened by the commercialization of it all and uh, the, the loss of the, the purity that a Pete Seeger brought to his music. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And that's really hard now that, well, as Reggie knows more than anybody here, the music industry has become so fractionated and yeah, <laughs> it, it it's, it's, hard to find that area between the local festival and having a big audience. I, a lot of my friends who have been on my Sunday shows are grappling with that. You know, how, how do you do that? You can't get on radio. We talked about radio before, even in the nineties, I wrote a story about radio in New York when I was at the New York times, about why you hear and what you hear and why you don't hear what you don't hear on radio. And it was so rev revelatory because 
like there was payola of all kinds, not just the old fashioned kind. And it, it's so hard to break through. Uh, and plus there's the consolidation in the media, which is right. huge networks to have a conservative twist to them. But don't right. look at you. Well, and that's why I like what the small island big song people are doing. It, it's kind of, they created a network, they built an audience and they're um, now they're touring in America. They're going to be at uh, James Madison University tonight uh, at a Earth Day concert. Con concert, and we I think we can do that even beyond music. The, if I think if we connect, if you find your thing, whatever your passion or question is, whether it's community gardens or uh, singing a certain song, if you can then look across the landscape of geography and community and see who else is facing similar questions. Heat pumps, getting a transition in your energy system is, you know, you can get overwhelmed, uh, but you can also connect with people who are facing similar struggles now using uh, these new media to cut through the noise, I think. And I hope uh, you all feel it isn't all despair when you get on your computers. Uh, Brighton, what's your sense having grown up with radio? Uh I mean, I've seen how it has also evolved over time. We're seeing the integration of emerging technologies like Twitter, Facebook, and the conversations are now extending beyond the coverage of a radio station, for example. Uh, but th there's just something very unique about voices and using stories to paint a unique picture about a specific problem and solution. And I believe this is something that, you know, uh, allows us to be able to uh, speak to people's emotions and inspire them about things that they can do. Because when you think about what's happening around the world, it might seem very humongous, very insurmountable. But I think through human stories, which could be told through music, through songs, uh, through storytelling, uh, using different mediums, including radio, we're able to sort of... Uh, bring to life things that humans can be able to do and i've been very you know uh very very uh passionate and i've spoken strongly about how human stories human interest stories can allow us to shape public discourse on the climate crisis for example and personalize all these experiences. Song is that um, um, We're sorry. So I've, I've seen, okay. No, my, I've I seen pressed how the things have been evolving uh, with time, but I think the essence of it all is to be able to communicate and use our voices to speak about things that we care the most about and be able to inspire hope in those that might be at the brink of hopelessness and uh, to inspire that spirit um, um, of um, um, perseverance, even when we are faced with challenges and people that think what we are working on is, um, is not a horrible reality. Right, and one of the things, I'm gonna to turn to Jocelyn for a second because she pointed to something she's working on one of the communication opportunities I see comes in getting beyond the hashtag or the uh, proclamation or the, the slogan. Climate emergency has been very uh, crystallizing uh, idea. There are even people, you know, it's being legislated in some places. But to me, it only really gains traction if you say, who's, emer who's emergency? You know, who is in trouble? Um, when there's a heat wave. And as soon as you do that, you realize that there's a vulnerability emergency and that's an opportunity. And it can be right down the block. In the Pacific Northwest, I did sessions on this where one of the world's leading experts in Seattle, uh, right down the street from Dennis, uh, Christy Ebay, who's uh, one of the world's leading uh, scientists focused on climate and health. She has said on my show, three different times. Nobody needs to die in a heat wave. Just like that. And it's a fact. It's a fact. Uh, if you know where the old couple is living in an unair-conditioned mobile home, or if you know where the homeless people 
are in your down the block from rich people and you can find a cooling shelter for them, then nobody needs to die in heat wave, even as we grapple with cutting CO2. So, so to me, a big opportunity driving concrete progress on timescales that we all can appreciate, meaning politically too, it means a politician can get something done in an electoral cycle um, on these grand questions is find the opportunity right around you. Um, I, and I think uh, to me, that's a source of optimism amid all the challenges. And you can do it, you can find it everywhere. South Africa, where those floods happened, we did a show several months ago showing that the key there is, uh, again, there were vulnerable, vulnerable communities. Guess what? There's no housing. And they had to uh, live in places that were marginal so that when the flood happened, they, they were the ones in harm's way. Uh, Brighton froze. He's coming in on another camera. So let me uh, fix that. Hold on one second. Um, I'll cut that. Remove from screen. And here is Brighton again. So uh, Jocelyn, you had some connection to this IUCN project, I think you were going to say. Yeah, um, so our discussion on storytelling really reminded me of this um, organization I've been a part of. It's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is one of the oldest international organizations for sustainability and nature protection in the world. Um, so I came across um, the Commission of Education and Communication when I was in New Zealand for the Youth um, Sustainability Conference, which happens every year and takes place in a different country every year. And it brings together youths from several countries. And at the event, one of the most impactful sessions I went to was storytelling. It is, we have youths from multiple countries in the room, all with different perspectives on climate change. How do we unite that? And it really comes down to just the power of storytelling. It's learning to think about what from your experience is really connected you to nature, how to express that so that others feel what you feel. And then through those connections, we're able to form a better platform to communicate and to come up with collaborations across nations and to come up with um, solutions for that. And um, Professor Ripken, you were mentioning so many different like um, individuals impacted by climate change around the world, but it's not just a fact. These people have stories as well. And that's why um, journalism and publications matter so much is that getting those stories and to making, making climate change more realistic for people. To, and once we have a more concrete idea of what the issue is, then we can find more adaptable solutions to the right, group, right groups of people. Um, so just, in, just some thoughts. That's great, those are good thoughts. I like what I'm hearing. Uh, we're down to the last few minutes and I'd love to have some sense of, again, uh, if we were to do this a few months from now, and I know, especially Sophia, you're heading out into the the work world. You're graduating. Congratulations, by the way, uh, very shortly. Um, what can we do uh, together to take things forward a little bit? The these grand challenges can be paralytic, as I said at the beginning. But and everyone, it's been sort of uh, hip to trash incrementalism lately. <laughs> Uh, there are people blaming it on industry saying, you know, even that ad back in the Earth Day uh, launch days of the Indian uh, who wasn't Indian, the Native American, uh, looking with tears at the trash uh, was kind of a campaign. Part of that became a campaign supported by industry, which is, you know, that that is what it is. But I feel incrementalism. I agree with Dar Williams. <laughs> that there's tons to do, especially if you network, whether your challenge is voting and changing politics or, or uh, energy transition, there's, there's huge opportunities. So what do we do, uh, Sophia? Yeah, this is one of my kind of biggest thoughts and why I got into sustainable development, actually, because I, the, I took a trip, I took a gap year and I went all over Southeast Asia and I just lived with, um, lived in really small communities and spoke with people and there was unlike in the United States everything was kind of like up front you could see where the trash was going you could see the people who chose to burn their trash because that's the only thing you could do with it or 
put it in a big pile somewhere. It was super in your face. And it made me feel that sense of like individual action needs to be done on my part. When I'm, when I return to the United States, instead of just throwing something in the trash, I need to think about that action. Um, and I think kind of the theme of today's talk is, is feeling and like talking um, what Jocelyn said really resonated with me. I think that taking care of our communities, making sure every single person is okay is the only way we're going to solve this problem. Because if I'm not okay, if I, I don't know where I'm going to sleep tomorrow, if I don't, if I'm hungry, how, how can anyone expect me to take any individual action to help this really scary climate crisis? So I think just societally wise and community wise, that's the first step. Um, and I, yeah, that's my kind of core belief in sustainable development. The first kind of checkbox is making, is taking care of human well-being because otherwise we're not going to have everyone on board. Um, yes, <laughs> I'm with you on that completely. And it, then it, that also reveals these broader opportunities. And the more people are safe, the more you can expand the community that's involved in the bigger issues. If you're not safe, if you're not safe, or if you don't have a cooking fuel to cook your your meat to your your meal tonight, then you're not thinking about the future. You don't have you you don't have the capacity, let alone the indulgence, to think about the future if your life is is only for the now. And Dennis, um, the Bullet Foundation and or you personally, where where do you go from here? What 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 are the possibilities? Let me go back just a couple of minutes of this talk, Andy. Of course. Um, uh, the, the Indian uh, ad is, is a really kind of important thing. Uh, one, it, it, it is not something that industry later picked up and went someplace with. It was constructed by the Beverage Manufacturers Association. And it was because we had bottle bills pending in a number of state legislatures and recycling legislation in many places. And they set up this ad to try to make it clear to the public, and they spent a fortune on it, that um, pollution isn't caused by the industries that are doing these things, it's by people. And they're of throwing away stuff out into the street. The real problem we were trying to address is that we were mining an enormous amount of aluminum and using it once and throwing it away. And they were, they were undercutting all of that by saying, no, this is personal responsibility. And that really ties into that issue that you were trying to raise of, of the, the last few months um, with a couple of books by people that I deeply respect in most regards, really criticizing individual actions and cares for individuals making it all focused upon institutions and anti-corporate behavior, all of which is central and has to play a role. Right. But man, the collective behavior of 7 billion people on earth and a few hundred million, a few hundred million in the United States is just enormous. And to the extent that we can change that, the impacts are great. Uh, and there are technological opportunities to change our lifestyles in ways that simply didn't exist five years ago that are dramatic. More important to that, though, than in the theme of this meeting is, is learning from the experience of the last few millennia of basically every religion. You get people to make a far firmer commitment to your values if they are doing something in their own lives that reflect those values. And if you're trying to proselytize to another audience and what you do, what you are, doesn't reflect what you say, then you become a hypocrite and totally ineffective. And so it's something that has really bothered me that, that so many of the people that I respect out on the cutting edge of pushing for radical environmental change uh, are themselves frequently living lifestyles that are impossible and incommensurate with that kind of a view, but, but disparaging people who are trying to pay attention to their diets and pay attention to their energy consumption, the kind of drawing that they have and everything else. It has to be all integrated into one whole. This is true. And uh, that what you just said gets back to the reality that there's something for everyone to do here. If you're an investigative journalist, uh, if you're Amy Westervelt, then get in there and reveal the history of fossil fuel disinformation. If your um, focus is on energy access for the, the, uh, those who don't have any, you can get out there and do that. If you, you can use radio, if radio is your skill to uh, build a constructive connectivity you can use your biology, you know, CRISPR is a tool that will be transformative in ways we still have not even begun to appreciate for better or worse. And so having an ethical approach to uh, technology going forward 
is key. Uh, Brighton, the work you do uh, building networks of young people is a huge part of the, the path forward. And uh, so I wish you all well on this, uh, on every Earth Day, and uh, we'll keep going. I, I don't know, uh, Reggie, if you had one final musical thought you could share to close this out, that would be wonderful. If, if, if not, um, I have other ideas. So, solar power, we must renew our energy. I love it. <laughs> There's a solar topia. Wasn't that a song too? Is that one that Pete did? That's beautiful. And uh, a song that you uh, have sang through the, the tough days of the BLM and uh, Floyd era uh, was um, about not resting and staying with the storm. Yeah. Well, it's called On Solid Ground. And, you know, when I wrote that song, I wasn't thinking about the relationship of ground to the earth to, you know, but, you know, I think more often we need to just explore how all of those levels need to be brought to uh, brought to bear in story and song and art and any way that we can. Um, those are the things that speak to us. And I love uh, what everyone has said, just to, you know, particularly about people needing to know that they're well cared for, that they're okay. Because uh, when it comes down to it, you know, in all of these issues, you know, the only way people can commit themselves to caring is if there's, first of all, some, you know, viable connection to their lives every day. And the second thing, if they are, if they can see that this helps them to be okay. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for being part of this today. At 4.30, if anyone is watching, I'm going to do a second Sustain What show live from the shore of the Hudson River with a team uh, sampling glass eels, that tiny um, post-larval stage of the eel, which is an ocean-wandering fish that's um, got itself onto the IUCN endangered list because it's uh, so coveted uh, in Asia as a that these the little stage has been devastated. And so that'll be 4.30. Uh, I, I, there's much more going on around Colombia today, including, I think, Consilience has a, a festival tonight. Is that correct? Some kind of an event? Maybe you could unmute yeah. or just... Um, so we're hosting our inaugural Earth Day Sustainability um, Summit. We decided to bring together three panels with um, New York City-based um, startups, nonprofits across technology, policy, and finance sectors to talk about our clean energy future. So if you're around campus, you're welcome to join us. Um, I, yeah. Fantastic. And so everyone here, thank you so much. Sophia Asab, Reggie Harris, Dennis Hayes, Brighton Kaoma, Jocelyn Chen for being part of this Columbia University Climate School to sustain what episode, Earth Day Generations. I am gonna close out with a little bit of the Small Island Big Song approach to networked music making. And they are amazing. I got to see them live in New York City. They had this very, they'd been doing this digitally and virtually for years and finally they got together. Uh, and they're doing an American tour, uh, just fantastic. So thank you again. Uh, you can share this episode right away when we're done on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And uh, here we go. One second. It's a song that gives a voice to nature, to the animals who can speak the same language. They are suffering. So we need them a vote. I want to do the finale. There are people who are not going to be able to do it. What do you Thank you.
Thank you again. Thanks all for being here today. And uh, let's stay in touch going forward. And do check out Small Island Big Song. They're just amazing. And that's a wrap.